Well, good evening to everyone. It is really a joy to be together tonight and um, enjoyed the visit uh, with everybody already. I hope that you enjoyed the, the time of music and that the Lord's done His work in preparing your heart um, today for our service. Uh, we, uh, we're in a little bit of a, a transition time here in our Wednesday night services in between uh, a series on, uh, on 2 Timothy and we'll be going into Titus here before too long. Uh, but I want to speak for a couple of Wednesday nights, Lord willing, here on, um, on a couple of the writings of John. We'll be in 2 John tonight. And we'll probably spend about two weeks looking at this short letter. And then we'll follow that up with a look at 3 John. And then, uh, and then we'll see where we go from there. But that's my initial plan here for the next few weeks anyway. So if you'll turn to 2 John chapter, well, it's, there's only one chapter. So 2 John, we're going to read the entire letter, a uh, very short letter. Uh, it's only 13 verses total. And we'll look at the first six verses this evening. But I'm going to read through the entire thing just to get the full context. Second John, verse 1. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments." This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Well, why don't we go before the Lord in prayer and we'll ask for his blessing on our study this evening. Our Father, we bow before you in prayer. We thank you that we're able to enter into your very presence and bring our cares and our petitions before you. Tonight, I give you thanks for the truth. I thank you for your word that you've delivered to us. And I'm fully cognizant tonight that as we open it, that it will very easily fall on deaf ears. If you haven't prepared the ground, if you haven't prepared the hearts, we know that it is your work alone uh, to open and exposit the scriptures to us. And I pray that you would give us good understanding of what we read tonight. Uh, we trust that you have all the answers. And I pray that as we, uh, as we open this particular short letter, that it would be a blessing to our hearts, that it would edify and build up and strengthen your body here in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but there have been times, admittedly, um, when I have nostalgically thought about churches in the Apostles' days and speculated on how fascinating it would have been to be a part of one of those churches. Anybody else here thought that way at all? Imagine being a part of a church that had been founded by the Apostle Paul, who had remained there in this particular location for about three years as its missionary and first pastor. Apollos came in shortly after that, another, another very, very important New, New Testament, Testament figure, and he spent some time in ministry there, and then Timothy, whom we know very well from our recent studies here, served as a pastor there after Paul for some time, and after he moved on, none other than the venerable Apostle John shepherded this particular flock. 
So it was a church that was full of talented leaders. Not long ago, we considered Acts chapter 20 and talked some about Paul's instruction to the leaders of this particular church. Wouldn't it be great to be a part of a church like that? Just, uh, just uh, bursting with talent and with ministerial ability. Well, I've just described the church at Ephesus, if you didn't know that already. And John wrote his first letter, 1 John, to that particular church and to other churches in that area throughout Asia Minor. And he wrote some, somewhere between the year 85 and 90 A.D. Well, as we saw in our study of the letter of 1 John, that was about a year and a half ago that we covered that, that church had some difficult problems that they were encountering. Paul had predicted it all the way back during his time uh, with them. He talked in Acts chapter 20 about false teachers that would arise in that church, and indeed false teachers had arisen in that church who claimed to have deeper knowledge of the things of God than what God's Word said or what they'd already been taught by, uh, by God's ministers. They claimed to have the secret to knowing Christ, but they denied several key doctrines. They denied His humanity in some cases and said that, yeah, He was God, but He wasn't really fully man. Or um, they, uh, they denied his deity in many cases. They taught a lot of other heretical concepts as well. And they attempted to really take some elements of pagan religion. We talked about this a bit on Sunday morning in our introduction to Corinthians. But they tried to take some elements of pagan religion and blend them together with Christianity to make it more acceptable to the pagan culture. Sound familiar? Um, we, we're dealing with that very thing all around us in our culture today. Well, in this particular case, when godly leaders confronted their errors, these individuals, many of them anyway, these false teachers, left the church at Ephesus to form their own churches, and they took many people with them, and it resulted in major conflict between folks in the church at Ephesus, uh, both just turmoil inside of that church and with others as well. We read about that back in 1 John chapter 2. Well, as in any church split, relationships were strained or were severed. People were confused and hurt. <clears throat> Rumors and false allegations circulated through the community. And so there was a need for godly leaders to really bring that church and those area churches back to the basics of the faith and reemphasize some critical truths and ensure that they were grounded in biblical doctrine. Every church needs to be strong in their knowledge of the truth so that their members can avoid such destructive heresies. They need to be strong in loving relationships with one another. They need to be holy in their conduct. Without those things, the church is, is inevitably going to be unhealthy and it's going to be more susceptible to the subtle deception of the enemy who's always trying to assault God's churches. Well, John the Apostle wrote the short letter of 2 John to a local church as a brief follow-up to his first letter. If you recall some of those major themes in 1 John, you'll notice in what we just read that he repeats many of the same ideas. And he addresses some of the same problems that he had addressed in the first epistle of John. Apparently, the false teachers, from what we can see, were traveling around. They were circulating around, trying to come into different churches disguised as teachers. And, uh, and particularly disguised as teachers who could take you farther in your Christian faith than you were currently at, or than that church could take you. We see that here in uh, 2 John and verse 9, and we'll talk about that more next week. But, uh, but despite their claims, they denied some essential truths about Jesus Christ particularly, and just about biblical doctrine in general. And so John writes this short letter before he could make what was intended to be a personal visit to address some of those issues, to warn that church, particularly about not receiving those men into their membership, not receiving them into uh, their assemblies. And, uh, and so in doing that, he really gives us historically a prescription for a healthy church. And that's really our theme here as we look at this tonight and then Lord willing, next week, we'll talk about what a healthy church really looks like. There's two parts. First of all, in verses 1 through 6, we're going to see tonight that for a church to be healthy, 
it must be sensitive to having an appropriate inner vitality, and that's based on a, a number of different things that we'll consider this evening. And secondly, not only must it be guarded, guarded inwardly by having the right uh, life and passion and focus, but it must be on guard to the dangers from without. And that's, that's really seen and developed in verses 7 through 13. And so we'll look at the first part today. We'll look at the second part in our next study. But today's focus is that for a church to be vibrant and to be healthy, she must be sensitive to having appropriate vitality within. And that flows from a couple of very important sources. Now, uh, a couple of interpretive considerations that I just want to mention very briefly um, that, uh, that we need to look at in 2 John. First of all, uh, other than just the title itself, who's the writer? How do we know who the writer is? He just calls himself the elder. And so who is the elder who writes this letter? Uh, and 3 John as well, for that matter. Uh, second interpretive question that we need to look at is who are um, the elect lady and her children to whom this letter is written without going into all the different ideas because there's a number of different ideas out there I definitely believe that the elder was the Apostle John um, he was so well known to this local church that he didn't even need to mention his given name it was obvious who was writing it now uh, um, the canonization process and then the preservation of Scripture has always attributed this letter to John. So there's never been a whole lot of doubt about that, but he was very well known. So he didn't give his, his personal name in this letter, and I think that there's a reason for that. As we've considered before, the terms elder, bishop, overseer, pastor, um, they're often used interchangeably in the New Testament to refer to specific local church leaders. John was an apostle. He had broad authority from Christ, but he was also a part of a local congregation where he served as a pastor. The apostle Peter referred himself or referred to himself as an elder in this same sense, just like uh, just like John does here. Now, due to John's age and the fact that he was the last surviving apostle out of the entire group, it may be that the church has just nicknamed him the elder and called him that frequently. It wouldn't have been inappropriate for that to be the case. Uh, but the term elder, it's a title both of respect and a title of authority. Now, uh, I'm going to leave it at that because I don't believe there's a whole lot of historical dispute about who the writer is, and, and that makes really good sense in the context of what's written. With regard to the elect lady and her children, um, there are two prominent views. Some think that it refers to a specific woman and her offspring, and with that view uh, in verse 13, the closing verse, the children of thy elect sister would be the nieces and the nephews of this unnamed random woman. Um, th that's, uh, that type of address is not typical in any apostolic writings. It's not typical from any of the writers. It's not the context in which the verbiage can be understood in any clear way as we're going to see through our study this evening. So let me just give you um, authoritatively uh, what I believe this is. The phrase is a cryptic reference to a local church and to its members. The children of thy elect sister would then be members of another local church. And using that kind of verbiage would make very good sense because these churches in the late first century were going through tremendous persecution during that time period. All of the apostles, excepting John, had been executed by this point in time. John himself, though the last living apostle, survived a botched execution attempt and was exiled um, to an island labor colony to live out his days segregated from the rest of the world. All of that indicates very easily to me that this cryptic writing manner, even though very easily understood by God's churches in that day, would provide some level of protection for John and those to whom this letter was addressed if the letter fell into the wrong hands. The language, um, especially John's affirmation here of love and his exhortation to love in verses 1 and 5 is a whole lot more appropriate to a church than to some individual woman. And, and again, we don't see the apostles writing in this type of way, uh, and it wouldn't have even been particularly appropriate for them 
to write in this way. The elect lady whom I love, and not I only, but also all those who have known the truth love this woman too. Well, um, uh, the, the language further indicates that this is a very clear follow-up to a prior communication that had been addressed to this church, which seems to mirror what John had to say in his first epistle, which was written to local churches in the Ephesus area. Also, in verses 6 and 8 and 10 and 12, if you look through those with a little bit of uh, discernment, John addresses his readers in the second person plural, using the words ye, yourselves, and you, which would point to the members of a local church rather than to an individual woman. Now, of course, uh, the, the imagery of a church as a chosen lady fits very well with the Bible's teaching of local churches being Christ's bride. Peter uses almost identical language when he says in 1 Peter 5.13, the church that is at Babylon elected together with you. Um, and then he addresses that. Well, church in that passage is really interesting. The word church is feminine in gender. And so, again, nearly identical language to what we see here. Now, uh, the immediate issue that John's addressing in both 2 John and 3 John is again that of traveling teachers that were circulating among these different churches and it was pretty common for them to have some type of itinerant ministry moving about um, and, and Paul frequently utilized this type of tactic himself between himself and uh, and many of his ministry helpers where they would kind of almost like a circuit writing type of ministry like we had earlier in the days of our country where there may not have been quite as many ministers to go around to the different population centers, and so they would travel to a lot of locations, maybe a lot like what, uh, what Brother Smoot does in traveling to different far-flung locations around our, our own state here. And so, um, so that's the, the immediate issue, right? So it was typical for Paul to do that. It was typical for John to do that. It was typical for a lot of the other leaders in the New Testament to do that. It had become typical and common then for these false teachers to try to mimic that pattern and circulate around different churches. And so where the intent was on the part of John and his followers to circulate around to these new churches or new bodies of believers and work to strengthen a newly established congregation and then move on to another one with the same intent, these false teachers were really doing the exact opposite. They're traveling around and they're undoing everything that John and the other disciples of the Lord were trying to accomplish. Now, uh, with that type of a, a moving ministry taking place all the time, those traveling preachers and teachers would frequently and generally be received into churches, and they would be given hospitality in various homes, and that's spoken of all the time throughout the New Testament. But what if the teacher claims to be a Christian but ultimately taught false doctrine, or they were found out to be teaching false doctrine. Should they be received or not? Should they be accepted and welcomed or not? How should they be dealt with? Well, I, I hope that you picked up through the reading here in 2 John already what the answer is to some of those questions. 2 John warns against receiving and warns against encouraging such false teachers, whereas the book of 3 John encourages genuine hospitality towards true teachers. And that'll be the contrast between those two books. Well, John had recently been in contact with some of the members of this church from what we can read through his letter here. He commends the church and he praises, uh, praises them that these members were walking in the truth. Very praiseworthy. He's not necessarily implying that others weren't walking in truth by saying that, but rather he was just simply overjoyed that those whom he had met were walking in God's truth. And so, once again, I've, I've just tried to give you the, the background and the history of this book, but more specifically in verses 1 through 6, he gives us a fourfold prescription for what must be found in the inner life of a church if it is to be a healthy church if health is to be maintained within that church, and if it's to be developed, if it's lacking. So, first of all, the inner life of a healthy church revolves around fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ 
and by extension with one another. And that flows out of our fellowship with the Lord. Now this concept underlies the entire letter. It's especially obvious in the salutation uh, where John first opens this in verses 1 through 3. And so, again, he says, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. In verse 1, and then again in verse 13, um, John uses the adjective elect to refer to these churches, uh, these two churches that are being addressed, uh, the, the one to whom he's directly writing and then the one who is writing to greet that particular church. An important term to understand in the concept of Scripture. Uh, I mentioned that Peter used that same word to refer to another church as well, another elect church. It's very interesting. This word elect comes from the Greek word eklektos. It means to choose out for oneself. It's a very similar word to ekklesia, which means to call out to oneself. Almost identical Greek words. Now, we understand this, that in this particular context, he's not talking about salvation. He's talking to a church, talking to an entire assembly. God is the one who does this action. He's the one who calls or chooses these people out. It has everything to do with the very special placement of specific believers in specific churches. They're placed there by him so that they might grow to maturity, so that they might enjoy his protection in that environment, so they might fellowship with him particularly. Understand this. I, I really do believe this as I study the scriptures. It's not chance. It's not accident. It is an intentional, personal, and intimate act that God accomplishes when he takes one of his children who's been saved and cares for him or cares for her enough to lead and to set that person in one of his churches. Collectively, as a whole body, God has selected out in this case and placed this church where it needed to be. He had placed exactly whom he deemed was needed and appropriate in that church. A true biblical church, folks, is a living body, vitally connected to the Lord and enjoying warm fellowship and intimacy with him primarily. Why does John emphasize God's choice to do this at the start and the close of this short letter? Well, it would be very practical and helpful because these churches were experiencing, experiencing turmoil. They were experiencing contention as these false teachers caused confusion and division within those churches. It would be a real comfort and safeguard against discouragement during those times to be reminded that God had personally placed his members in those churches for their spiritual maturing and that he would complete what he started if they remained close to him. These false teachers would not and could not undermine what God ordained to do in and through his churches if people were faithful to him. And so that's just, uh, just uh, an important observation to make, first of all, as we consider that, uh, that the inner life of a healthy church, it's going to revolve around fellowship with the Lord, and the Lord has specially taken people and planted them into His churches for their benefit and so that they can grow to maturity. The greeting that we see here in verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace, is notable it only occurs in 1st and 2nd Timothy in the New Testament other than right here. It marks a very clear and logical order through which God leads a person into a personal walk with himself. It's the order in which God operates in any individual's life. A relationship with God begins when his grace reaches down to us in our helplessness. We don't deserve it. It's a free gift. As Paul puts it in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, For when we were with, yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. 
That should be descriptive of every single person here. I hope that everybody here has a full comprehension of that. God's grace doesn't reach down to pretty good folks uh, who are just making an honest effort to seek God out and do their very best. Grace is God's undeserved kindness to the ungodly who deserve His wrath. Mercy, says grace, and then mercy. Well, that points to God's compassion towards us in our misery that's due to our sins. The focus of God's grace is more towards addressing our, our guilt and our need for forgiveness of sins, but mercy is directed towards relieving the devastating consequences of our sins when we come to the right comprehension of His truth. And peace, well, that points to the result of salvation both to the peace of God in our hearts and to the peace that we enjoy with God Himself because of the cross of Christ. We who are naturally at war with God in our nature are reconciled to God because Christ bore the penalty in our place. And the cross removed the barrier to fellowship with God, welcomed us into His presence as His children and allows us to be accepted by Him because our sin is addressed. And so you have this very natural and beautiful progression, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, there's, a, there's a bit of an interesting variation that doesn't quite come across from the Greek to the English, and there's always some level of translation difficulty from one language to another. Uh, but it says really this in the Greek, uh, or here in the English, it says, grace be with you, right? In the Greek, the emphasis was specifically, grace will be with you. And so we lose just a little bit of that sense uh, as it comes across into the English language. It's not a prayer like we often see in these greetings. It, it is an emphatic statement to us. Grace will be with you. This is written, remember, to local church members to a particular church that was going through some difficulties. Grace will be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. Now, the tenderness of the writing that you can see characterizing this second letter from John and, and third John as well, um, and the phrases that he uses throughout this writing, they're very very emphatic in nature. They reflect something of John's intent in writing this brief letter. The emphatic will be with you uh, reassures his readers that God's grace is constant. He won't abandon them. He's using very personal language throughout. He uses the words us and we throughout this epistle to reinforce their bonds together with the Lord as partakers of his grace. The truth that these blessings of grace, mercy, and peace come not only from the Father, but also from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, brings out the truth of the deity of Jesus Christ very plainly, which again was very much attacked in those days. It was attacked by the false teachers that, Paul, or that, uh, that John was addressing here. It was, this statement was a clear opposition to the teaching of those heretical teachers. In truth and love, towards one another as God's servants are indicators of genuine character and life that flows from an intimate connection with the Lord, which the heretics and the false teachers visibly lacked. They didn't have that. It wasn't evident in their lives and it wasn't evident in their communications and interactions within a church, but it is characteristic of members of a scriptural church and people who are definitely connected to the Lord. There's going to be a level of of charity and intimacy amongst those folks that's not seen anywhere else. Now, the application of John's opening greeting is that being a part of a local church is not primarily a matter of attending services. Please hear me on this. It's not just a matter of merely attending services. I'm going to church, or I went to church for my hour for the week. As important as uh, attending church uh, services or even joining a church membership, as important as those are, what he's writing here in the application of it is a matter of coming into a vibrant and thriving personal fellowship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, 
and then growing within a church body because he has chosen the church in which he desires every one of his children to develop and to mature. If you're not a member of a local church and you're saved, then you're not following in obedience to the pattern of God. To be part of one of his churches means that you have personally experienced God's grace, mercy, and peace through salvation. You've been led to embrace the truth. You've responded in obedience to God's placement in a church so that you can grow and become fruitful in your spiritual life. Now, at times, I've encountered people who claim salvation, but they shun the Bible's instruction towards church membership. At times, I've encountered people who claim to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, but they join or they remain in a liberal church that denies many of the doctrines of God's Word. Can I just say that these are not the elect lady to which God calls his people. They're rather a, a perversion or a counterfeit built by Satan to distract people from the truth, to facilitate the type of false teachers that John was warning about in this letter. At times I've encountered people who follow the Bible's instruction to join a local church, a biblical church, but upon joining they fail to serve in any meaningful way at all. At times I've observed People who've joined a church, and they may even try to serve in some ways, but they're clearly doing so without any kind of spiritual vitality, any kind of spiritual energy or passion. Friends, God's objective is to get people out of their sinful lifestyles and pagan religions and plant them into healthy local churches which follow all the Bible doctrines where they can grow and serve. A church is a called body of people who have a living relationship with God the Father through His Son and enjoy intimate fellowship with Him and with one another as an outgrowth of that. That's point number one. Number two, what we see in this letter is that the inner life of a healthy church is founded on God's truth alone. Right? It is founded on God's truth alone. Now, John is obviously concerned with the truth. I'm always looking for key words as I read through passages of Scripture. He uses the word truth five times in the first four verses of this letter. John emphasized in his gospel that all of God's word is truth. In the context of this short little letter, the truth that is emphasized centers specifically on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, that is the source of all truth. The heretics that John was warning about were deceiving people about the person of Christ. You can see that very plainly in verse 7 of the text. And some of the more common errors that they taught, as I mentioned, claimed either that Jesus didn't have a real human body um, or that the, the, the Christ spirit came upon Jesus the man at his baptism and left him just prior to his crucifixion. Well, those errors went directly against the person of Jesus that John had personally seen and heard and touched. He talks about that in John chapter 1 and verse 14. First John chapter 1 verses 1 through 4, he talks about how they had seen and, and handled him, the word of life. Now, wrong views of the person of Jesus Christ invariably spill over into wrong views of his work on the cross. It's going to happen. If you deny Jesus' true humanity, then he couldn't possibly be the substitute for the sins of humans. And so it's essential to hold sound doctrine on the authenticity and the divine authority of the word of God and the person and work of Jesus Christ. Christianity is not based on the religious speculations of philosophers. That's what the speculations were based on for these heretics, these Gnostics and Greek philosophers and Greek heretics in John's day. That's not what Christianity is based on. Christianity is based upon the revelation of God himself and the person of his son, Jesus Christ. The apostles spent over three years in personal interaction with Jesus. And they bear eyewitness accounts in the New Testament to his life, to his miracles, to his death, to his resurrection, to his ascension into heaven, every facet of his life and ministry 
They saw it personally and they reported it as eyewitnesses. They make it very clear that Jesus is God in human flesh. My friends, churches of Jesus Christ are made up of true adherence to God's word of truth. In verse 1 of our letter here, John describes them as they that have known the truth. In verse 2, John indicates that those who truly do know the Lord and are living in obedience to Him in the context of a scriptural church have God's Word dwelling in us. The verbiage gets very specific and it personifies truth as Jesus Himself. The truth which dwelleth in us. The truth of God's Word abides in His true followers as Christ Himself abides within His true followers. Jesus Himself claims to be the truth in John chapter 14 and verse 6. John says that the truth um, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. And, and that's a reference both to the Word of God and to Christ the Word. Now contrary to the current prevalent postmodern philosophy of our culture, the New Testament affirms that truth is both absolute and it is knowable. The truth centers in all that the Old and New Testament affirm about Jesus Christ. That's the focal point. That's not to say that's the only thing that matters, like some liberal churches might try to suggest. But that is the focal point. That's the starting point. To know Him personally is to be in the truth and to have the truth in you. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to become a theologian or have mastered all biblical truth in order to be saved uh, and in order to be able to serve Him effectively. To be saved, you simply must recognize that you are a hopeless, condemned sinner in desperate need of a Savior and that that Savior is Jesus Christ. You trust in Him and He'll save you. So, truth is knowable. Truth is absolute. It doesn't mean that you must have it all mastered to be saved or to serve Him, but it does mean this, that as a believer, every one of you should be measurably growing in your understanding of the truth. You should be gaining a mastery of it. Sound doctrine is crucial, both for salvation and for effective service. The difference between healthy, sound churches and unhealthy, unsound churches or imposter churches is whether they are built firmly on truth alone. When John says, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. The word walking implies that truth is something that every believer must continually grow in and maintain in over time. A healthy church will be fully invested in the work of perfecting the saints for the work of the ministry and that's done by continually, measurably building its members in the truth. We just finished a year-long study through the book of Hebrews on Sunday mornings, which resoundingly emphasized the choice of believing and applying the truth of God's Word, particularly about yielding to Jesus Christ as Master and Lord in every area. Don't be one of those who resist and wrestle against and bristle against God's truth to your own destruction. Be one who loves and who receives and who applies truth, resulting in continual spiritual growth. And so we've seen that the first mark of a healthy church is that its inner life revolves around an abiding, intimate fellowship with the Lord. And the second mark of a healthy church is that it is founded on God's truth alone. The third point that we can see developed here through these first six verses is, is that the inner life of a healthy church expresses itself in love. Once again, one of those key words that we see come out through this scripture. John's concerned about both truth and love. He uses the word love four times and he implies it several more times in these six verses that we've read tonight. Love is from the Greek word Agape, twice in those four times that it's used, and agapeo, twice. It's just a variation of agape. Both of those words speak of benevolence and goodwill, either that which is expressed as an attribute of God himself 
or that's expressed by God's people once they come to know him. A person who knows God because they've begun to reflect that which God is. God is love. We've defined it from John's writings in the past in this way, that it is a, a caring, self-sacrificing commitment that seeks the highest good of another person. It is not mushy sentiment that's being spoken of here when we talk about love and when John exhorted these people, that, uh, telling them that he loved them and he loved the truth and, uh, and that they should love one another and all these different things. It's not mushy sentiment. It is a choice. This biblical concept of love, it is a choice to regard that which is best for another and sacrifice whatever is necessary to bring it to pass. Truth and love are inseparable. Truth defines what the highest good is for all people. And love is the choice to take action to try and bring it to fruition. Truth and love are frequently found together in the writings of John. He loves to convey those principles together. And again, they're intrinsically linked. There are many who set aside truth and make a compromised, human-defined, emotion-driven, unbiblical notion of sentiment and make that the basis of unity, no matter what's believed. That's not love. And that's not truth. Truth must be the, be the, the basis for fellowship and for unity. If somebody denies the truth, particularly on the essentials of the gospel, he or she's not a Christian. And we have no basis for true fellowship with that person. What they need is they need someone to genuinely show them love and care about their soul enough to bring very direct challenge to them and show them what the truth says and try to break them out of their, uh, out of their deception. As we'll see in verse 10, and we'll look at next week, if somebody is promoting false doctrine, the loving thing to do is not to welcome him as a brother, but to separate from him as someone who's promoting evil. And so our love for others must be discerning. We must never permit ourselves to dampen the truth for sentimental feelings. Paul said of the Philippian church, this is a great statement in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9, a church where he, he just writes about how uh, joy is the theme of the book of Philippians and how their joy is constantly overflowing in the Lord. They're a very vibrant church. They loved one another. But he says this, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Hmm. If somebody came to your door who was infected with a highly contagious disease, such as tuberculosis or, or something else that was very likely going to kill you if you contracted it, you wouldn't be acting in love to your family to welcome him in to come and to stay with you. Since false doctrine about the person and the work of Jesus Christ is a deadly infectious disease. It's not loving to welcome those who are infected with this disease into our church membership or into our homes. Now we're gonna look more at this next week and I'm not trying to be uh, harsh by that. I'm just trying to make some very clear biblical conclusions and apply the balance between truth and what the Bible depicts as godly love. And so, um, uh, but among those who truly know and love Jesus Christ, our love and our unity grows out of God's truth, doesn't it? That's where it stems from. That's what builds closeness and intimacy and genuine love. And while biblical love is not sentimentality, and it's not emotion, but a choice to seek one another's highest good by applying truth, there is great warmth and sentiment and intimacy and emotion and affection that does permeate the inner life of a church as a natural outgrowth of biblical love. I hope that you notice how these verses resonate with the reality that we ought to genuinely love one another and also love and be committed to the institution of the church that Jesus built. Something that came out to me very plainly in reading this. Verse 1 tells us, that John loved Jesus' church, and he claimed that all those who have truly known the truth love her too. Look at what it says. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, 
but also all they that have known the truth. Now, there's a problem when people claim to be Christians and they don't love churches. And they won't be a part of a church. It's God's intent for things to operate that way. It shows that they haven't really known the truth. Let's throw away this unbiblical spirit that seeks to be independent from the accountability of belonging to a church body. It's not, grie- uh, it's not um, grievous to be a part of a church. As many people try to depict it to be, it is something that thrills the heart of a true believer. I think that uh, that goes to show, uh, again, that there are many, 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 in fact, the vast majority who claim Jesus Christ but haven't really known the truth. Their lives show it because their lives really don't revolve in any substantial way around God's churches. And those who do love the Lord's church won't just love it because of what they can get for themselves or because it fills some social need in their soul, but they're going to love it for the truth's sake. That's what John's talking about. They'll value God's churches because God does. They'll value their church because its primary mission is the delivery of truth to the world. And they've aligned their lives with that purpose too. And so that's what thrills them and that's what drives them. So the first mark of a healthy church is that its inner life revolves around an intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The second mark of a healthy church is that it's founded on God's truth alone. The third mark of a healthy church is saturation with biblical love for God, for one another, for His truth, and for the church that God has made you a member of. And number four, the inner life of a healthy church is maintained through obedience. It's maintained through obedience. Now John has emphasized truth five times in these six verses. He's emphasized love four times by by name, and several times he's alluded to it. He also emphasizes obedience in these verses. The word commandment occurs four times in verses four through six. You might remember that there were three primary tests of an authentic believer that we found in the book of 1 John. We saw that authentic Christianity consists of believing the truth, loving one another, and obeying God's commandments. Those three key tests that can be applied to any person's life to show whether they really know the Lord or not. John says in verse 6 that we are to walk after His commandments. These commandments are referring right back to what He said about believing the truth in verse 4 and expressing love in verses 5 through 6. That's what He specifically identifies as God's commandments. And so these are all intrinsically tied together. Uh, This is the the vital proof, whether we make... uh, whether we obey and we make application of those principles, it's the vital proof of whether we really have biblical love and whether we really do believe the truth or not. Now, when John emphasizes twice to his readers that God's commandment, which we had from the beginning in verse 5 and which they had heard from the beginning in verse 6, he means that Jesus Christ himself gave us these commandments as foundations for his local church and that obeying them, hear me, Obeying these things should be basic entry-level Christian teaching and practice. They're, They're around, they're there from the very beginning, guys. The first thing that a believer, a new believer, should learn is that being a Christian means obeying Jesus Christ as Lord by submitting to His truth. And that doesn't matter what area the truth might cover. There's just a yieldedness and a submission and a humility in obeying the truth. A key commandment of Jesus is that we love one another. There is a a, a submissive humility to one another. There is a, a natural care for one another that drives us to make sure that we give people what is best for them, what they really need. <clears throat> and a key commandment um, uh, fr- from the from the entry to the Christian life, this complementary characteristic of of truth should be defined and it should be emphasized to people. The the truth itself, the application of truth 
to one another and obedience to that. Those all go together hand in hand. Now, love, I'll just emphasize one more time since that seems to be the, the overarching focus here in what he's writing about and what certainly people today try to definitely emphasize and focus on. It is a commitment a choice that seeks the highest good of the person who's loved. I hope that you guys have got that by now, okay? When that type of love is fostered for Jesus Christ, then there will be no bristling or resistance at his truth, but a happy submission to it. Happy obedience, joyful obedience. When that type of love is fostered for Jesus' children, there will be no offenses between those in his church, but a joyous submission to truth together. We ought to stand for truth to the death if necessary. A church that's centered around truth and love and obedience in all of those areas will find its membership standing together shoulder to shoulder in unity, protected from false teachers, protected from false professors, and guarded against impurity. It's a tragedy that many churches are racked with dissension because self-centered, proud people who profess to know Jesus Christ try to force their way within those churches. Strife, contentions, power struggles, and wars abound in many church bodies. Now, we're going to see that illustrated very plainly to us in 3 John in the case of a man named Diotrephes who loveth to have the preeminence among them. This is usually done under the guise of some pious cause claiming to defend some particular truth. And that person may even convince himself or herself of the worthiness of their cause in bringing that war in. But invariably, it's not really God's truth from God's word at all, but tradition or some human opinion. Power-driven people are motivated by pride. They're motivated by self-will. They're motivated by self-importance. They need to be confronted with their disobedience to Christ's commandment of love. Now, in conclusion, I'll just say this real quick and then I'll be done. If we wistfully think that these first century churches didn't have these sorts of problems, uh, we're not reading our Bibles carefully. It may have been a fantastic thing to be able to experience such a, a wonderful church ministry as the one at Ephesus where Paul and Timothy and John had all pastored. Both 2 John and 3 John, though, show us that even a church founded and pastored by those individuals had some serious problems that came in. Even though I love to think idealistically, this also means that we'll have problems too if we stand for God's truth. Everybody who takes a stand for God's truth will be slandered for being unloving. The solution is never to compromise the truth, nor to become unloving in defending that truth. A healthy church is built and maintained by collectively maintaining an intimate, personal fellowship with the Father, based on what the Son of God has done for us. As we seek that together, that intimate, personal fellowship should tightly, inseparably, and sincerely bond us to one another. We're privileged tremendously privileged, unspeakably privileged to be called together by Jesus Christ himself. A healthy church is built and maintained by holding tenaciously to truth. A healthy church will love one another by expressing that truth to each other. A healthy church will obey Jesus Christ in all things. That's part one of John's prescription for a healthy church. To be true to scripture now, folks, we must continually ask God to search us. We need to ask Him to search our church. We need to ask Him to search us individually. We need to examine ourselves. We need to immediately address it. If we see any unhealthiness or unsoundness in this church body, ask if you're a healthy member of this body. Ask that. Ask yourself. Ask God. Ask other church members. If there's any lack of these four principles in your life, you should immediately repent and you should submit to the Lord. Let's pray.